This is a production of Cornell University. So, I'm going to talk about the quest to dial down nitrogen today, and I bet some of you are wondering where I got that title from. Somebody told me that they were surprised to see the title from someone serious like me. So, I'm not going to tell you who said that. I'm going to share with you some information. You can find anything on the internet. There's an advertising slogan generator. There's the URL. Now, I had choices, and it was hard. <laughs> but I ultimately settled on this one because I could relate it to my research. I like this one, but I couldn't think of how to relate it to my research. So if any of you can think of how to relate this to what I'm talking about today, let me know afterwards. Okay? All right. So um, today I'm going to talk about some of the recent projects that we've been working on in my lab. And I want to thank you all for coming. And I really appreciate this opportunity to, to share this with you. Um, I'm going to first start by talking about the context of the work we do in the lab. I'm going to spend about a third of the talk on that um, because there are some new discoveries that are really um, useful to apply to the problems that we work on. So I want to spend time talking about that before I go into three different projects which I'll, I'll touch on briefly, beginning with some mass balance work. Um, and then I'll talk about some of our work in nitrogen fixation. We've been doing quite a lot of work on nitrogen fixation in many different settings for the past few years. And then I'll tackle the monster project that is the um, collaboration with social scientists and biophysical scientists about linkages across the um, ecological, social ecological interface. Okay. So. The one thing that's notable about the problem of, of nitrogen loss from agriculture is its persistence and also the global extent of the consequences of this problem. So about half the nitrogen fertilizer is lost from agricultural systems. And this really it varies depending on the type of system that you're talking about. But it accounts for about 3 quarters of the anthropogenic nitrogen that's been added to the global nitrogen cycle. And there's a number of environmental consequences ranging from increased greenhouse gas emissions and climate change to um, changes in ecosystem species composition and function due to things like nitrogen deposition, and then also eutrophication or pollution of freshwater and also nearshore marine um, environments. So that now we've got about 400 hypoxic zones, and actually the number is increasing. So before I go into um, some of the work we're doing, I want to just review the nitrogen cycle really briefly for those of you that don't live immersed in nitrogen, like we do. <laughs> um, so in an unmanaged uh, ecosystem, the internal cycling dominates. Most new in is coming in um, as, uh, from nitrogen fixation. And then there are multiple losses. It feels weird to use a laser being this close, but <laughs> I need a stick. There's um, multiple, uh, I like this better. There's um, multiple loss pathways. These are usually small, but they can vary. And actually understanding variation in these losses across ecosystems has been a focus of a lot of, um, of forest and um, other ecologists working on ecosystems. Okay, we have a different situation in agriculture. We've got this huge offtake through harvest, so to compensate, we add nitrogen fertilizer, which increases our inorganic nitrogen pools, especially nitrate, which then pushes these loss pathways, particularly denitrification and leaching in North America, and to some extent, <coughs> ammonia volatilization. So how do we deal with this problem? Well, what's notable about the approach that we've used um, is that we're focusing mainly on this single pathway here. So nitrogen fertilizer goes into the soil in this plant available form. And the strategy is to increase the efficiency or delivery to the crop. And there are many, there's a plethora of technologies that are all geared towards increasing this efficiency. The sort of guiding, sort of, um, the, the guiding strategy is the four R's. You can find this all over the internet with, you know, how to improve your nitrogen management, focused on using the right product at the right rate and time and place. So delivering it to the crop roots when it's needed. And this strategy has been somewhat effective. There are some cases where um, the efficiency of fertilizer use has been more than doubled by 
Side dressing, for example, five times during the growing season is, is one thing that's been effective. So the approach that we've used in, in my lab to address the problem of nitrogen is, is sort of complementary to this, where we focused on a number of processes at the same time. And there's two areas of ecological um, research that are the basis for most of our work. The first comes from ecosystem ecology, and this is called the nitrogen saturation theory. Nitrogen saturation is defined as when um, the nitrogen influx in exceeds the capacity of the ecosystem to assimilate nitrogen through either plant or microbial uptake, or to store nitrogen basically in soil organic matter res reservoirs for the most part in ways that could be accessed by plants or microbes later on. So once you get beyond this point, um, then you are at saturation, and I'll, I'll talk about the symptoms in a minute. But this um, framework is able to predict the ecosystem response in pollution or atmospheric deposition. And actually, that was one of the main reasons why this framework was developed by a group of um, ecologists working in uh, forested ecosystems in the northeastern U.S. So they were trying to explain differences in nitrogen loss and retention that they saw in these natural ecosystems, which were all, in theory, undisturbed. They had very high biodiversity, no tillage. You know, why were they losing so much nitrogen? And this has had a huge impact on um, ecology, and I think also it has potential to really um, inform agriculture. It provides a framework for understanding um, how nitrogen cycling uh, is connected to other elemental cycles. In particular, this connection be ni between nitrogen and carbon is highlighted. So, um, there we go. So here's the symptoms of nitrogen saturation. You can see beginning from um, increased rates of nitrification through to the losses and also the form of nitrogen that's lost and increased um, nitrous oxide fluxes from denitrification. These all are basically what we see in agricultural systems because we're managing them as a nitrogen saturated system. And this is one of the challenges in trying to reduce nitrogen losses by solely focusing on nitrogen alone. And so losses are a symptom of nitrogen saturation, whether you're talking about forests. In this case, these are three forests in, um, you know, in North America compared to temperate forests, so a similar kind of environment. Um, these are forests in South America. Nitrogen deposition from um, human activities is very high in North America, and so we see very high losses that consist mostly of nitrate in these forests. We see a similar thing in agricultural systems with this relationship between the nitrogen input um, explaining about half the variation in unrecovered nitrogen. So a second area of um, ecological knowledge or research that is the basis for some of our work is this is, comes from rhizosphere ecology, and um, Brian talked a little bit about this uh, a couple weeks ago at the grad review. Um, and the recognition for the role of plant microbial collaborations in driving decomposition. So one implication of this is the realization that this very small, limited habitat, um, the rhizosphere, which is minute compared to bulk soil in some ecosystems, actually dominates nutrient cycling in some ecosystems because there's so much activity. Another aspect of this that's been, um, has had a big impact is just recognizing that here's another adaptive strategy that plants can use to, for nutrient acquisition. Um, and this, this could be something that we could intentionally manage in agriculture. So this is shaking this view of decomposition as solely a microbially regulated process. Sure, you can still put soil in a jar and you'll still get decomposition. And that is useful for asking certain questions, but um, we have to realize that that's not reflective at all of the decomposition that could be occurring out in the field or in a, you know, an intact ecosystem. Instead, um, this collaboration between plants and microbes where the plants are providing labile carbon to the primary decomposers, so bacteria and fungi, um, allowing them to break down the more recalcitrant organic matter pools, take up nutrients. The release of the nutrients actually requires other participants from the food web, 
So when grazers like protozoans feed on these primary decomposers, there's a net loss of carbon and a release of inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus that can be taken up by plants. And the predators also can play a role if you've got that level of complexity in your, in your food web. And this all happens in the rhizosphere. Very, it's very tightly coupled. This process can increase decomposition compared to bulk soil by two to tenfold. So that's some of the, the numbers that are out there. And we think that this mechanism actually then can explain this observation that here's three of our very important crops, corn and um, small grains. And the majority of the nitrogen that these crops take up comes from the soil. So less than 40%, despite having plenty of fertilizer, less than 40% of the nitrogen in these crops in 217 studies came from the fertilizer. So that's, that's sort of the, um, you know, shows us the challenge that we're up against. So if we take this information together, we can see that this problem of leakiness in agriculture is, is really systemic. And it begins with this use of inorganic nitrogen, which is the most difficult form of nitrogen to actually control in the environment and to keep in ecosystem. And it's exacerbated by the fact that plants are going to take up nitrogen from soil organic matter because they've evolved um, along with microorganisms to be able to access those pools. And then when this is coupled with some of the structural changes in rotations that have increased fallows and have reduced um, inputs of carbon into the soil or um, accelerated decomposition through tillage, um, we end up with a soil that's got even less organic matter so that we've got microbes that are in the soil and they basically are starved for carbon. They're not interested in nitrogen. So the potential to absorb nitrogen is, is reduced in these systems. So there's kind of multiple levels um, where we have this problem of limited carbon and we end up with lost pathways such as denitrification and nitrate leaching predominating. So we use a typology um, to describe the different strategies for approaching this problem of nitrogen leakiness. Um, and from an ecological perspective, we can identify three distinct strategies. So one is end of pipe, where, and we don't really work on that very much. So we just say, well, we know that we're gonna lose nitrogen, so let's intercept it before it gets to the places where we don't want it to be. So this is something that's getting a lot of attention, attention, particularly in the Mississippi River Basin, where about 30 years of work at the field scale has still not resulted in significant reductions in nitrate in the waterways surrounding these lands. Okay, a second is fertilizer-based or the single process. So I already talked about that one. That's the dominant approach. And then a third we call ecological or CN coupled. So these approaches manage multiple processes and, th and are focused on agroecosystem scale nitrogen retention as part of the process with the strategy of reducing the nitrogen surplus, since we know the surplus from nitrogen saturation theory, we know that the surplus is a big driver of losses. So one way to reduce losses is to be able to somehow reduce the surplus nitrogen that you're adding to the system. So I'm gonna start by talking about some of our work with field scale um, nitrogen mass balances. And our question here is basically, how does management impact field scale nutrient flows? And of course, our hypothesis was that these methods that um, involve increasing carbon nitrogen coupling or that are targeting or impacting multiple processes that affect nitrogen retention are going to show reduced surpluses and reduced nitrogen losses. And I'm gonna talk about two pieces of work um, from my former graduate student, um, Jennifer Blesch. Um, we first did a meta-analysis of the N15 literature in order to ask this question, what are we finding in the experimental plots in terms of nitrogen recovery? And then um, we went to the Mississippi River Basin to those grain systems because a great deal of this research that's been done on um, nitrogen using N15 has been done with grain systems, particularly in temperate systems. So these are some of the results from the uh, meta-analysis. So for those of you not used to looking at these, so if there's no effect of a management practice, and the management practices are listed here. So I'll take nitrification inhibitor as an example. 
If there's no effect, then we'd see the average change here at zero. Instead, we have it at nearly 7%. So this means that compared to the standard practice, which is, is um, broadcast fertilizer in most cases, using a nitrification inhibitor um, increased the nitrogen fertilizer recovery by nearly 7%. Okay, so we can see we kind of got, we've got them arranged in order. Of the two practices that focus on fertilizer, proximity to the roots and the timing, particularly of you know, fall versus spring, had the greatest impact. So increasing the recovery um, by 24 and 18 percent. But compared to these, we had two sort of ecologically um, based or CN coupling based um, practices, crop rotation. So this is a more complex crop rotation that reduces bare fallows, and then the source of Nitrogen could be manure, compost, or legumes. Most were um, legumes and manure. And both of these practices increased recovery by about 35%. So we wondered, well, what will we see if we go out to farmers' fields? Will we see this kind of a range in um, the recovery or, or loss reduction? Well, you can't manage, you can't measure losses out in working fields very well unless you've got, you know, a sort of a multi-billion dollar budget to <laughs> put all the instruments out in the field and a bunch of farmers who you can then pay for all the inconvenience of doing that. So instead of trying to measure losses, we constructed budgets for these fields, simple nutrient uh, nitrogen mass balance budgets. So first of all, we looked for, we found four regions in the Mississippi River Basin where we could actually find a diverse range of farms. And this is not easy to find. Um, in, that, in that part of the country. So we were able to find um, systems that range from the dominant corn-soybean rotations to those that, some that incorporated winter grains or had some diversity in their rotations to others that include perennials, forages, legumes, and then some, we also found organic production systems that don't use any fertilizer nitrogen at all. So that was our continuum in these four regions. We identified 110 field farms and use two fields um, in, in each of those to construct a budget. And it's a simple input-output budget. So the inputs were fertilizer, biological nitrogen fixation, and nitrogen from manure. And then the output, output that we measured was the nitrogen harvested. And um, we constructed the budget just as exports subtracted from inputs to get the balance. And we know that surplus will drive losses, so the greater the surplus, all other things being equal, the more vulnerable the system is for nitrogen loss. Um, if we find deficits, then there's a danger of mining the soils. And we found um, that these mass balances agreed very well with what we found in the meta-analysis from the research plots. So the legging base, if we look at the, the nitrogen sources, the legging base had the the smallest surplus, meaning that they have the um, least, they're least vulnerable to nitrogen losses. There was a, an interesting difference between spring applied versus fall applied manure, so systems that put manure on at different times, if they put on the fall, they tend to really be over applying nitrogen. And then the fertilizer based method sort of fell out in the middle here with surpluses that range from about 35 to 38 kilograms per hectare per year. And if we look at rotation, this, so this is just summer annuals, just corn soybeans. This is, we had only 29 fields that actually incorporated a winter annual only. And then we had almost 70 that had perennials. And usually perennials often means that they also have legumes. So we cannot tease apart the effect of rotation or perennials from the use of biological nitrogen fixation. That's one of the the challenges of doing on-farm studies. But we see that you know, it, um, we feel good because this agrees with the meta-analysis and also with the predictions of nitrogen saturation theory. Laurie, what, what were the oh. bars in black and white? Were we only looking oh, at the Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I was pointing out the, the these are the surplus. So this is the input. This is, um, yeah, this is the oh, addition. The this is the export, and that's the surplus. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. There's no key there. This is the danger of, yeah. Okay. Clear now? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. 
The other interesting relationship that we see in this data set is that as you increase the proportion of nitrogen that's derived from biological nitrogen fixation, you also reduce the surplus. And we do have some here that are showing a small deficit. We only saw this relationship if the nitrogen rate, the annual additions were over, were 81 kilograms per hectare or, or over. Um, but it was pretty consistent. We've also seen this in some of the regional farms, and I'll, I'll show you some of that. So this is an intriguing result because it suggests that you know there is some inherent efficiency of, of increasing the proportion of nitrogen fixation that you're you're using in your system. So um, we think that these results show that there's there's multiple benefits. It's a win-win situation. Not only do we reduce nitrogen losses, which is what you get if you improve fertilizer use efficiency, which is a very important outcome, but we also will see reduction in greenhouse gas emissions because nitrogen fixation is a solar power technology, and I think it's one of the underused solar power technologies that are out there. Um, so we've got a great one in agriculture. <laughs> so we also end up building organic matter reserves, which will enable plants to rely on this mechanism that they've developed over uh, through evolution of, of breaking down organic matter and accessing those pools. That is a very tight tightly coupled system, and it's, it's quite resistant to nitrogen losses since it's occurring in the rhizosphere, a very small spatial scale. And there are other benefits such as some drought resistance that can accrue as you build organic matter pools. Okay, how am I doing? I'm doing okay. I'm going to move on to talk about nitrogen fixation. And specifically, I'm going to focus on some of our on-farm work that Megan Japansky did when she was here doing her doctoral research. And we started out with, originally, when farmers were asking lots of questions about nitrogen fixation and how much nitrogen they thought they would be getting from these green manures, we went to the literature because I was not doing research on nitrogen fixation. And we found that there was just very little information, particularly on the kinds of legumes that were being used as green manure crops. There's a lot on soybeans, not too much in farmers' fields, and a fair amount on alfalfa. But for many of the species that farmers are using in, in the Northeast, there was just very little data. So we started by looking at nitrogen fixation in um, organic rain and um, vegetable systems and also some conventional systems. So nitrogen fixation really should be the primary source of nitrogen for organic farming because Haberbosch nitrogen is forbidden. When farms use composts from conventional agriculture, they're actually you know, subsidized through synthetic nitrogen, but it's, you know, it's allowed because they are recycling a waste. But the reliance on nitrogen fixation is even worse in organic vegetable systems. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. I'm not going to talk about that now. So we have this huge range just in organic systems in terms of how well they're managing and using nitrogen fixation. When we look at the impact of this on the, the, the balances, we see that it really doesn't matter whether you're talking about Haberbosch nitrogen or compost. If you're relying on those kind of, on inputs and, and using very little nitrogen fixation, you tend to have larger surpluses. These are the organic grain systems that had much higher proportion of nitrogen coming from nitrogen fixation. So these organic vegetable systems are creating an environmental problem as well, even though they're using a different source of nitrogen. They are operating, they may, there may be a delay in the rate of nitrogen loss, but eventually those systems will become saturated, even though they're adding some carbon. And also they tend to have really an over-application of phosphorus too in these cases. So we were very interested in looking at how differences in soil fertility impact nitrogen fixation. We also wanted to understand how planting the legume either as, as a monoculture or with interseeded grasses impacted nitrogen fixation. We expected that in fields, and th this was done in um, regional farms in the Finger Lakes um, with a, you know variations in their history of management, we expected those that had a legacy of using legumes would have higher soil organic nitrogen pools, and that there may be some suppression of nitrogen fixation. Because if you have more nitrogen available in the soil, then normally the legumes downregulate nitrogen fixation because it is so energy intensive. Um, we also expected that when the, and we use red clover in this particular experiment, that red clover 
planted with the, the um, wheat, interseeded with the wheat, may fix nitrogen at a higher rate, but it might end up fixing less total nitrogen because of reduced growth. So maybe competition from shading, for example, could end up reducing the total amount fixed. These were some of the things that we, we thought we would see. So we, in this experiment, um, one central piece was to look at the frost seeding of red clover into winter grains, grains and evaluate um, the performance of that practice because this is a very important practice in organic grain systems. And it has many benefits in terms of keeping the soil covered and reducing uh, tillage. So in order to do this, for those of you that aren't familiar, you start with wheat um, in the winter and the legume, the red clover is frost seeded, germinates in the spring. The canopy closes and it, it stops growing for a while until harvest takes place. There's a small canopy. And then after harvest, when the grain's removed, it fills the field. You have a field, a stand of red clover that can be cut, um, but it is used as the green manure uh, for nitrogen fertility for the following <coughs> corn crop. So these, um, these, this research was conducted by embedding replicated plots into farmers' fields. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all the methods here. If you have questions, ask me later on. <laughs> um, so we did find that as the proportion of reliance on nitrogen fixation increased, that overall nitrogen fertility increased. And this is from a number of measurements that beginning with the inorganic pools through to some of the labile pools to the total organic nitrogen pool. Because um, one single measurement really isn't a very good indicator, indicator of nitrogen availability in the soil. But we didn't see, even though we had a fair amount of variation, we didn't see any suppression of nitrogen fixation in the clover that corresponded with the increases in um, soil fertility. We did see um, some significant impacts of the way the clover was planted with clover in a monoculture having a lower fixation rate. So in, when clover was growing by itself without a non-legume as competition, it was able to take up more nitrogen from the soil and fix less compared to clover that is interseeded with the winter grain or clover planted with orchard grass. So this was our other comparison. This is the farmer practice. This was clover planted with a perennial grass. However, when we looked at the total nitrogen fixed, we found that it was actually highest in the farmer practice because the rate of nitrogen fixation increased, but there was no reduction in total biomass production of the clover. Whereas, so the clover in a monoculture had a great biomass, but not as much nitrogen from fixation. Clover with the orchard grass had a higher rate, but a significant suppression in the overall growth or biomass production, and that ended up reducing the nitrogen fix. So from the perspective, well, the farmers are doing the right, <laughs> the right thing in terms of managing clover in these systems and managing nitrogen fixation. Um, so we started with grain farms because they are a lot simpler to do this kind of work in. They have similar crops. Um, they're located on some similar soils, whereas the organic vegetable systems where we, we have um, a lot of problems in managing nitrogen fixation and Farmers, ha there's a lot of interest on the part of farmers in work that will sort of inform their management. We, we were working up to them. But in the grain farms, we found some vari variability in soil nitrogen fertility, but it, it's below the threshold for nitrogen, uh, for BNF suppression. And this is not the case in vegetable systems. We know that fertility is high enough that it is suppressing nitrogen fixation in some of these farms. Um, a strategy that uses interseeding in a way that minimizes competition between the legumes and the non-legumes is, is really an optimal strategy. You get the benefits of competition for soil nitrogen and you know reduce nitrogen availability to up the fixation rate. But since their growth is staggered, that gives the clover a chance to grow without competition for light. And this on-farm work, and we have some work we've done in vegetable systems is the basis for the next phase of research in cover crop mixtures that Emily will be carrying out. She talked a little bit about that. Okay, I'm on the last project. I'm actually doing okay. <laughs> I mean, I thought three might be pushing it, but I don't know, two just seemed, you know, three is nice and round. Okay.
So I'm going to talk a little bit about the interdisciplinary project that used the Mississippi River Basin and the problem of hypoxia as sort of a case study to try to understand how the linkages across the social ecological interface drive agricultural management regimes, land use, and intensification. Um, and you can imagine, here's the research team and our institutions and various um, specialties, that this is a complex project. And we all complain, those of us that do this work, <laughs> that even we're always you know, at meetings giving talks in 15 or 20 minutes, which is really hard for the, these kinds of projects. But I'm going to just pick a couple of things to show as examples to maybe pique your interest and get you interested in doing this kind of work. It, it does take time, but it's been a really um, valuable experience. I've learned a lot from people from the, you know, the cross disciplines. So the Mississippi River Basin epitomizes an intensive industrial system that is high yielding. It is one of the most important food production systems in the world. The last statistic I have, which might be, have gone down a little bit as production expands out into developing countries, was nearly 80% of the world's feed grains come from the Mississippi River Basin. And um, there's an extensive network of research and extension and government policies that support this agricultural system, and there's also some very significant environmental consequences. Um, the main one being that you probably are familiar with is the dead zone or the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And so far, although there have been some improvements in fertilizer use efficiency in these systems, so far it hasn't impacted the nitrate levels in streams draining the basement or the hypoxic zone. So this is this year's um, the size of this year's zone. They track it every year. It's smaller than predicted, and they've got some ideas about why that is, but it's right just barely above the five-year average. So we're not seeing a, you know, a trend downward yet, and there's some ideas about why there might be some lags in this system. So the two overarching questions of this project, what are the key social ecological linkages governing the current agricultural systems? And how could these linkages be modified to expand the ecosystem services delivered by this, this agricultural system? And I'm going to talk specifically about some work that was done in collaboration with Stephen Wolf and his graduate student, Stephanie Huffenagel Eichenmeyer. Um, and so one way that this is framed is to look for evidence of adaptive coupling, which is defined as an appropriate response to environmental degradation. Um, so one question that uh, was addressed in the project, are resources targeting the regions that are responsible for the hypoxia? And I'm going to talk about research resources and then the policy-driven um, incentives. So first we need to look at, well, where are the nitrogen losses coming from? They're ending up in the Gulf. This is work done um, with Mark David um, using county-level um, nitrogen budgets. And when we run that analysis, we find that you know, the, losses, the greatest losses occur here in this blue zone. And as the color gets lighter, they get lower and lower. Um, and so these losses are driven by the intensity of the agriculture, the, in other words, the proportion of the area that's in corn, fertilizer rates, and the presence of tile drainage. And this turns out to be a real key factor. Does everybody know what tile drainage is? It was invented in New York. Anybody not know? Oh, they're okay, I'll tell you what it is then. Basically, it's um, installing these pipes, which used to be made out of tile, now they're made out of plastic, about a meter down in the soil, the depth varies depending on soil type, um, and they have holes, they're French drains. So in these heavy soils, which are, you know, many are former wetland soils, it provides uh, drainage, so the water, instead of standing, percolates down into these drains, and then moves out of the field underground into a bunch of drainage ditches that surround, there's a network of, of ditches that surround it. So this has a huge impact on productivity. And this is really what enabled some of these wetland soils, which are high in organic matter, to become hugely productive for these crops. Okay, so let's look at the resources in terms of research. So for this, um, we analyzed the USDA CRIS database and we analyzed 10 years of data looking at, pro at projects that related to nitrogen management 
And Stephanie used that typology that I mentioned earlier, end of pipe, fertilizer, and um, ecological. And um, first of all, she looked at the amount going to different regions. So here's the Corn Belt. That's where the problem is. Here's the Gulf of Mexico states. They're the recipients of the problem. And a greater amount of, <laughs> of research on nitrogen management is going to the problem area, uh, recipients, not the people making the problem. So that was interesting. And this was, that was actually one of Stephen Wolf's predictions. So if we look at the, um, the temporal trend in investment, we see a similar thing. This is for the Gulf states where overall total investment's going up, and the Corn Belt states where the overall investment is going down. So this is just one database. It's just the Chris National Database. We would have really liked to look at state budgets for research, but that's pretty much impossible. And that is one of the problems that we found is that there are many things that would help us to understand how well we're doing in terms of tackling this problem, but the data is simply not available. And a lot of this is data more in the social system, resource allocation, for example. Okay, so the second um, sort of resource allocation question has to do with the um, incentives that are generated by our agri-environmental agri policies. And so this is the Farm Bill, um, which is slated to change if they ever pass another one. However, the proposed um, insurance-based incentives will actually parallel the, the um, commodity sort of yield subsidy based incentives in terms of the farms that qualify for them. So <clears throat> what we found, if you can remember the dark areas contributing to hypoxia, is that the payments for crop production naturally are going predominantly to the areas that have the high yields and are the most intensified, but they're also the areas that are contributing to environmental degradation. If we look at conservation payments, we see just the opposite, where those areas that are really productive and have the high corn yields and also are the most leaky and contributing most of the nitrogen to the streams are not interested in conservation payments, which tend to be less. So this is not nearly as lucrative as the crop payments. Now, there's a lot of things going on within the policy world and in, in, in RCS to try to correct this situation. So this is not, people are aware that if you have a high yielding farm and you've got fertile soils, most of the conservation options that are going to improve your nitrogen management just are not economically appealing to you. And that's something that can be addressed through policy. So we're in the midst of doing some work with this database of this county level database um, that has all the agricultural practices, fertilizer use, and all of that information. Um, by combining it with the crop product, the soil productivity index that's been developed by NRCS, and data from um, the census of ag, the economic census, and the what is it? The new one, community. American, <laughs> American Community Survey. Yes. Now we have a new. Beyond, beyond the census, we have a new um, survey that captures socioeconomic data from communities. So we're in the midst of taking the next step with this to try to understand how the biophysical environment impacts agricultural structure and whether or not, and ask whether or not there are cascading effects for rural communities. And the questions we're looking at here, um, how does the biophysical setting influence agricultural intensification? and the response of agriculture to policy market signals. So we know about you know, the counties that are actually receiving payments. We know about their impact on, envir on the environment and the structure of their agriculture. We want to ask, is it going to the next level up of the community? Does soil fertility influence the socioeconomics of rural communities in um, intensified landscapes? We actually didn't think there would be very much of an impact given you know, the, the high degree of industrialization of the system and its, it's you know, reliance on technologies and inputs to produce yields. So I'm just going to show you a couple of plots of the data. We will be doing some multivariate analyses of this data because that's really the only way that you can analyze this sort of a complex data set. Um, but the, the 
Initial correlations look promising. So yes, corn yields are higher in the soils that have the higher productivity potential index. So that made me feel good about the NRCS index. And um, we see that intensification, so this is a question about if we compare the corn acreage in the, this period in the 1960s to corn acreage from 2002 to 2006, how, how have the changes been on a county level basis? So if they're down here in the negative, we lost corn acreage. If they're up here, we gained corn acreage. So from this, you can see that intensification is continuing and it's continuing in those counties that are already the most intensively managed and are also the problems the problem counties from an environmental impact perspective. So the policies are continuing to foster um, and exacerbate the environmental degradation that is currently occurring. And then if we look at some of the relationships between pr productivity and um, economic outcomes, first looking at the percent of farms reporting losses, we find an inverse relationship. So the proportion of farms that report losses in high fertility soils is much lower compared to those that are in um, the lower fertility soils. And, and this relationship was even stronger than the relationship to corn yield, suggesting that the policies that were using the incentives that reward yields actually exacerbate differences that are occurring due to the differences in soil fertility. And then this last one is looking at the impact of soil fertility on the number of families living below the poverty level. So the question is, does this difference in soil fertility and farm structure and you know, the intensity of agriculture, the incentives that you know, are passed down from the agro-environmental policy, does that impact the broader community? And, and we see that there is a correlation of R squared of 0.29 with lower rates of, of poverty related to the high fertility soils. I mean, this is commonly seen in subsistence agriculture, but I, I was kind of surprised to see, I mean, that's a pretty strong relationship. So the, the work that we're doing um, with this database, which we're, we're building, we're adding other variables in, we'll be, we'll be u looking at this um, relationship between soil fertility, access to, um, to amenities, so shopping, uh, you know, grocery stores, medical facilities, and those kinds of things. Because the, the stereotype has been that people that live in counties, well, based, it's not a stereotype, based on some research in California, um, we expected that counties with the highest productivity and the greatest intensification would have overall a lower or reduced quality of life based on the amenities available. Because you have a depopulation of, of the counties. Um, where you've got lots of agriculture. Or are those, uh, oops, sorry. Right, yeah. Uh, are those farm families or all families in the county? It's all. It's based on census data, so it's all families in the county. So it'll be people working in agriculture and, and everybody else. Uh huh. So, so that could just be that the most productive counties. It's all farmland and no cities. Well, and I. This is only rural counties. Yes, yeah, um, and that's, uh, you know, this is just a first course analysis. We have to look at a lot of so per capita questions. Right, yeah, because if you, if you leave the urban counties in, it really confuses things because urbanization tends to occur um, where the more fertile soils are. <laughs> so then it, you know, it really throws a wrench in. Yeah, so for now we've left those out. Okay. Yeah, so to, to summarize um, you know, what, we, what we found so far from this project, and it's, I mostly limited it to some of the, the results that I presented. So um, looking at this as a system, it, it's evident that maladaptive coupling dominates. In other words, the way the system is responding to policies really at a national level that, that keep pushing it on its current trajectory of intensification and of you know, production or yield as the main focus. Some counties have actually taken steps to try to reverse that trend at the county level because they realize that they're, they're losing their communities. And so there are incentives such as five years of no taxes if you convert to organic farming. Um, and certain counties have implemented programs where they preferentially buy 
produce from local farms in order to provide a market, because if you're out in the Midwest, you really are tied to the global market for the most part. Um, so the, and this is due in part to these commodity payments that support, support mainly corn soybean production and sort of leap over and you know, swamp or just completely you know, overwhelm any local initiatives for the most part. And this, um, and this intensification is particularly pronounced in the areas that are you know, really mainly responsible for nitrogen loss and hypoxia in the um, Gulf of Mexico. And if we look at just research and policies, there's sort of a, you know, an irrational um, allocation of resources at this point, which, which needs to be corrected. OK, here's my final slide. <laughs> oh, I made it in time. So OK, so how can we reduce nitrogen? Well, of course, I think that we need to exploit ecological processes. And this, this will be a challenge, because there are many barriers that exist in institutions and um, you know, at government policies, I've, you know, if you meet with economists, they like a single number. They don't like a complex sort of, you know, decision matrix of A, then B, or if C, then go to Z. They don't like any of that. They don't like interactions. And <laughs> but of course, what we're doing when we use these ecological approaches is we're trying to take advantage of these interactions that actually drive the system in the direction we want to go to have multiple benefits, so more than yield, you know, to deal with water quality, to increase soil organic matter, and the sort of cascade of positive outcomes that are offered there. So um, I don't think that Haber-Bosch nitrogen is going to go away. I think it's an important tool, um, and we should be strategic about how we use it, because, you know, while we still have cheap fossil fuels and we can supplement with solar-based technologies, um, that could be a key strategy for transitioning agriculture towards sustainability. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Good, no questions. You guys can go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, sorry, I was disoriented for a minute. It sounded like you were <laughs> coming from above. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yes, foundation. Uh, I you, uh, where did the Mississippi River Basin increase in clover usage and perennial uh, pastures in rotation with the corn? Uh, it seems like that would cause a fairly substantial change in the U.S. food system. How would we Americans be eating differently if that came to pass? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of people talking about changing diet. Um, I mean, 40% right now, 40% of the corn is going to ethanol. So, you know, that is an issue. We export a huge amount for the grain, I mean, for feed grain. So it's a, really a global diet issue, not, you know, not just our own diet. So um, I think that, you know, there are some challenges, but I also believe that um, I think that we could increase the diversity of our landscape without taking a huge hit in yield. Um, one strategy would be to substitute wheat as one of the feed grains, which is already happening in organic systems um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so this, you know, part of the problem is this complete reliance on corn soybean. Of course, I am a strong advocate of, you know, eating meat in moderation, recognizing that, you know, it's ecological cost. But I think that that is a, you know, a much broader, challenging cultural question. Certainly, we should um, not be encouraging meat production to be you know, cheap. I mean, we should try to incorporate the real costs into different foods. So rather than have our government you know, try to subsidize the production of meat and other animal products um, so that they are inexpensive, maybe you know, some way to balance. And I think a lot of the work on ecosystem services is looking at you know, how can we monetize and um, get some actual, you know, cost that reflects the true environmental costs or the, the things that we've externalized. So that is a very good question, and um, it's more than I can answer in two, two minutes. <laughs> Oh, okay. I must have encouraged this. 
Well, I think that um, I do think that we should continue to provide incentives or subsidies for agriculture. I think it's different than other industries, um, and I think that we want to keep as many people in farming as we can or as we have right now. I don't think we want to continue to go down the road of, you know, reducing the number of farmers even more and, and having farms, you know, increase in size. There's no evidence suggesting that that's really going to improve their ecological efficiency. And there's questions about the value in terms of production outcomes. Um, a nitrogen tax is, is something that's been on the table, and I think that Europe, the EU, has, EU has gone that way in, in certain respects putting caps on nitrogen fertilizer rates. Um, I, I actually think that experimenting with a couple of those kinds of tools to sort of help the transition begin. One might be rewarding farmers for cover, which is something that NRCS is trying to do. So they do have a small incentive program for cover, you know, increasing your coverage, reducing bare fallows. Um, I think that in certain places no-till is reasonable and combined with cover cropping it can be valuable. Policies that would encourage the integration of animal and crop production so that they're not spatially separated and distinct from one another could have a lot of benefits. The, you know, the ultimately, if, uh, uh, the most efficient rotation is one that includes crops that relate to animal production, so pulling forages out of the grain systems is one thing that's led to a lot of the problems that we have in those systems. So that could be a key thing. Yeah. Why don't you think, Lori, about you know, a lot of farmers who have grown up being uh, nitrogen conscious but not knowing about some of the ecological things that you're talking about. Grew up with this notion of um, applying the fertilizer carefully, you know, how much they put on, and you know, making sure the timing is right. So when you go to legumes, they have uh, problems with adjusting to a situation where you don't know how much you're putting on. And the timing is much more mm -hmm. nebulous. So right. what do you say to a farmer coming from that perspective? Well, you know, first of all, I don't think the, that the responsibility can all fall on farmers because the systems that they have now that are dependent on the technology that's been developed to support this intensification actually make it more difficult to then go, you know, backtrack and add diversity in. So th there needs to be some, you know, work at the higher level, and there needs to be research on how to go back to using biodiversity in a way that makes sense strategically and, and results in these multiple benefits. In terms of managing legumes, though, one benefit because you're impacting so many processes is that you don't have to manage them as closely because you do, you build up the labile organic matter pool. So we just did a pod experiment with a, you know, soil from a conventional field, soil from an organic field, uh, 20 years plus of organic management. And about the, the wheat took up about twice as much nitrogen from the organic soil and was able to produce, you know, a, a yield that was twice as high as the wheat from the conventional soil, even though we added some, you know, small amount of legume residue. So initially, it's more of a challenge, but you can always supplement legumes with fertilizer. You don't you know, have to keep it pure unless you're aiming for organic certification. So if a farmer was interested in legumes, I would tell them, I mean, I would give them recommendations about the legume to fit into their niche, you know, the open spot they've got in their rotation, and then maybe talk to them about how to eyeball it and be prepared to add some fertilizer to get them through. Right. I think once that you've been managing your soils in our climate organically for at least 10 years, that if you have a low stand of clover, you're, you, you could potentially get away with it. I mean, you might want to supplement, but I mean, there's still not a lot of data on that, on you know, what's, how does soil type interact with management in terms of rebuilding these labile pools, but it's definitely some of these more labile um, pools that are available to plants that are, are being impacted, which is what we want to do. Now, one question is, since these, these soils do have greater capacity to mineralize nitrogen, you know, are they going to be more prone to, to leakiness? Are cover crops enough to capture that nitrogen? So we, we, really have to be, uh, we really have to avoid bare fallows if we're going to build up 
these organic matter pools. We could have other problems. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>